Hi, everyone. Sorry about the delay. There's like a few glitches, but welcome to Good Parenting Brighter Children Facebook Live. I'm very excited about um, my guest speaker today or my guest uh, person that I'm interviewing. That is Ford the second. He is a sixth generation jazz musician from New Orleans. I want you to think about that for a minute. Is there a talent, an interest or a hobby that you have in your family that's been passed down for six generations and counting? That was represented in years, at least 150 years. So that's pretty impressive that they've been, the Ford family has passed down that legacy and love of music for six generations. Thaddeus is going to talk about that, gen, uh, that legacy, where it all began, who started it, the instruments they played, on up to his legacy as he is a, a trumpeter. He's also passing his love for music down to his children, which will be a seventh generation. And he's going to talk a little bit about um, his children and the things that he does su to support and encourage them. He also started the Thaddeus Ford Band, and in 2017, it was named the Best Jazz Act by the Dallas Observer Music Awards. And he's going to talk a little bit about that and the music that he's recorded. And I've also asked him, he had a, experienced a tragedy in his early 30s, and it changed his perspective on life as well as his music. I think it's always interesting how it seems to always be some tragedy in our life that changes our course in life and puts us on a different path, and usually it's that path that is the one that's the one that we should be on. So we're going to bring Thaddeus up right now. There you are. Great. Okay. Here we are. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you Perfect. heard the connection. I am sorry. I don't know what happened there. I don't know if you Not a problem. But um, what we want to start out with is we want to start out with you talking about your um, musical legacy, where it all started, who, you know, the first people that came, and uh, we'll start there. Sure. Back in the 1800s. <laughs> yeah, so so there's some debate, and I don't know if I have to hold the microphone like this or not for you guys to hear me, but uh, there's some debate on the exact year, but uh, from what I've last heard, it was 1853. I've been saying 1875 for a couple of months now, and, and some members of my family were like, no, no, it's 1853. So we'll say somewhere in the, the, the late 1800s, my family immigrated from Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic to New Orleans. So, I mean, obviously, New Orleans was probably the most cosmopolitan city in the United States at that time. So, you know, there were immigrants from all over the world. And uh, my family was there when jazz wasn't even jazz. It was just, you know, some music being played that felt good. And the first person in my family uh, who immigrated was this guy named Narcisse Gabriel. He was a bass player. And so from him, uh, we get to me and my kids. I'm the sixth generation, and hopefully my children are the seventh generation. Amazing. Now tell us about um, one of the big influencers in your life musically. There's so many. I mean, uh, you know, when you have six generations of musicians who have come before you, I mean, obviously your family um, is, is, well, is one of my greatest influences. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, I, I grew up in New Orleans, so, you know, there's so many musical families in New Orleans, but um, so I don't feel unique in that respect because, I mean, it's just everybody, for the most part, comes from a musical family. But um, I guess one of my biggest musical influences outside of my family would be Miles Davis, trumpeter of Miles Davis. And then who is this picture here? This is of your grandfather, Clarence, correct? That is my grandfather, Clarence, on the tenor saxophone. He, uh, he was probably my first teacher of jazz. My dad taught me trumpet, trumpet. He was a trumpeter in the Marine Corps band. But my grandfather was the first musician to actually take me under his wing and teach me uh, the music and the language of jazz. And he toured with everybody in the 50s and 60s, the, the heyday of rock and roll in this country. Uh, Fats Domino, he was on all of those seminal recordings, um, the early days of rock and roll. Little Richard, uh, he was even on the, um, what's that record by uh, Patti LaBelle? Uh, I always pronounce it wrong. Voulez-vous, sous say soi, say soi. They recorded that in New Orleans in, I guess it was the late 60s, early 70s. So he was on all of those records that were recorded uh, in New Orleans from the 50s on to the 70s. 
Oh my goodness. And and didn't you also tell me that he took you under his wing and he actually spent time with you teaching you the trumpet he did. And with you as you practice yeah. and all that. Indeed. He did he didn't actually teach me the trumpet. My dad was a trumpeter, so he taught me the technical aspects of playing trumpet. My grandfather basically taught me the language and what it meant to be a jazz musician. So um, I guess it was the, the fall of, or the spring of 1993, I met Wynn Marcellus at my first high school, St. Augustine in New Orleans, and he did this clinic for the uh, Jazz Fest Foundation. And so he came to the school and my dad was actually in the audience. And at, so Wynn was playing, and I mean, he was playing trumpet and playing piano at the same time. Excuse me, and I'd never seen anything like that before. So I immediately went up to my father at the end of the concert and I said, That's exactly what I want to do. So my dad said, Okay, that's what you want to do. Call your grandfather up. So I called my grandfather. I actually I didn't call him up immediately. I called him up uh, a year later, a year and a half later, and told him I wanted to be a jazz musician. So he said, Okay. So I I I was in summer school that year, and so he asked me to come to his house um, during the summer every day and i mean it was just literally it was it was in a tra tradition of the griot tradition like in africa where you know information is passed verbally not necessarily academically so he literally gave me this tape uh the name of it was lewis cottrell's creole jazz band he gave me this tape and he said pick a song go home and learn it so i picked the song that the title sounded the hippest to me it was a song called make me a pallet on your floor and so yeah, I know, literally. So I was 16 years old at the time, and so I went home, and the, the vocalist and the trumpeter on that record, uh, his name is Wendell Brunius, um, great trumpeter from New Orleans. So the, the, I'm not going to go into the lyrics, but they basically talk about, you know, make me a pallet on your floor, make it soft, make it low, so your man won't know. And I, I don't know why my grandfather gave me that tape to learn, but so I, I took it home and I learned that song, and, and that was the first song that I learned. Uh, when I decided I wanted to be a jazz musician. That's amazing. I love it. Now, let's go to the next picture. This is of your father, actually. And he, That's my dad. Yeah, he played in the military uh, jazz band. Yeah, he did. He did. He was, and it wasn't just jazz. I mean, it was the whole military thing. So, that, I mean, they played, you know, marches. They played, you know, the classical march repertoire. Um, he was in the Marine Corps for 15 years. Um, he joined the Marine Corps after my parents divorced when I was two. So this was 1980. Uh, he actually got out of the Marine Corps the year that I graduated from high school, which was 1996. And he, he never finished his uh, college degree. So he decided after he got out of the military that he wanted to go back to school to, to get his degree. So my freshman year of college was his first year back in college. And we actually went to the same college, majored in the same thing, had the same name, played the same instrument. So we were like, I felt like as a freshman in college that we were a side show. I mean, because we looked alike, we played the same instrument, same name. I mean, it was great looking back, but at the time it was like, it was, it was kind of strange. No, this is great. I love it. There's another yeah. picture that we have of your dad in the military band, this one. So yeah. what a great... Mm -hmm. Example, what a great legacy. Let's flip over to uh, another one of these pictures. There, here's you as a little boy. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, you were your parents. Did they? Did you realize that you had come from a legacy? I think you told me that you were like oh. four or five there, right? Yeah, I think I was four or five, and that, that picture is actually my family's favorite picture of me because uh, I think it, it basically summarizes my personality. Uh, at that time and still today, um, just curious, just, you know, curiosity is, 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 is who I am, Mr. Curiosity. Uh, but I didn't realize that I came from a musical family until I was maybe, I mean, I realized my dad played, I realized my uncle played, I realized my grandfather played, but I didn't, re I didn't know the entire legacy of my family until maybe five or six years ago. Uh, uh, a guy in my family who actually wrote a book. His name is Larry Gabriel. He's, uh, uh, he's my cousin. He's my dad's cousin. He actually wrote a book about my family's legacy, and he found me. I can't remember if it was on MySpace or Facebook, but he found me because he didn't know I existed because um, my dad passed away 20 years ago. 
And so he didn't, he knew I existed in terms of my dad having children, but he didn't know that I was out here playing music and professional or whatnot. So he reached out to me on Facebook, we'll say, and uh, I mean, he was just flabbergasted. So the book he wrote uh, actually only went up to five generations. And so he rewrote the book to add me, the sixth generation of musicians in my family. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Now, this picture is when you were in high school. Was this at yeah. the NOCA? This was when I was at NOCA, and there's about one, two, three of those guys in the picture actually were students at NOCA with me. But the name of this band was called the Ace of Spades Brass Band. This was the second brass band that I joined, the first. And we were professional. I mean, you know, we were doing gigs and you know, making money and, 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 you know, just living the life as young musicians. I was 16 in this picture. Great. And for the audience, uh, NOCA is the New Orleans, uh, New Orleans, uh, excuse me, Center for the Creative Arts. A, a very, very famous school, actually, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, the first jazz instructor there was a guy named Ellis Marcellus, and you may not be familiar with the first name, but, I mean, the world over knows Marcellus family. So he's actually Winton, Brantford's, Delphio's, uh, Jason Marcellus. He's their father. So all of the Marcellus family went to NOCA. Uh, Harry Connick Jr. went to NOCA. Uh, there's a famous actor. You've seen him in so many movies. Window uh, Pierce, a uh, famous actor, went there. And, and so many people. Wow, that's amazing. Let's go to the next yeah. picture. <clears throat> okay, and this is, is this one of your band? That is my band, augmented with uh, some dancer friends of mine. Uh, Michelle Gibson is, is one of my creative partners. She's a choreographer and dancer. She actually went to NOCA, uh, too, and we're, we're doing a, a project right now. But that picture is from this project that I did called From, from Tragedy to Triumph. Um, and it basically was an original piece of music that I wrote along with original choreography. And uh, we, we actually got a grant from the city of Dallas to uh, do that project last September 2017. Amazing. And tell them a little bit that that was um, loosely based on your life, on the experience yeah. that you had with your heart attack. Do you want to talk about that now? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what year are we in? 2018 now. So three days before my 35th birthday in 2013, um, I was driving to a rehearsal and I started experiencing some physical sensations that I had never experienced before. Um, but being only 35, the, the last thing on my mind was that, okay, I'm having a heart attack now. So I just assumed it was some sort of anxiety attack or just something minor, relatively speaking. And so uh, sort of long story short, so I started experiencing all of the, the telltale characteristic signs of having a heart attack. The, you know, profuse sweating, the extreme nausea, the vomiting, the um, faintness. I couldn't catch my breath, the whole scenario. So I was about five minutes away from my then girlfriend's house. And uh, once I came to, I drove myself back to her house. And I said, I, you know, I don't know what's going on, but I think I need some water. And she was like, no, I think you need more than water. I said, no, you know, being stubborn, what have you. And so she convinced me to... Uh, go to the emergency room and got to the emergency room and they hooked me up to the EKG and uh, the, cardi the cardiologist came in and he said, uh, you know, what are your symptoms? Well, did you have any symptoms prior to this? And I said, yeah, you know, I experienced some stuff, but, you know, I, I just kind of passed it off. And he said, well, what were your symptoms? And I explained it to him and he said, well, why didn't you come in then? And I said, well, I was busy. He said, well, if you weren't busy, well, if you were busy for one more hour, you wouldn't be here anymore. So um, turns out one of my arteries was 100% blocked. Uh, I didn't know that. My dad actually died of a heart attack in 1999, um, but he was a chain smoker. So, you know, we all assume that, you know, that was his reason for having a heart attack. I wasn't a chain smoker. I mean, I, I was 35 or 34 at the time. So heart attack was nowhere on my radar, but it turns out I had a hereditary condition that um, was probably, uh, I guess, some of the personal things I was going through at that time, some stress-related things kind of 
push me to that realm. So, but I'm here and uh, I survived and, you know, I got a stent placed in one of my arteries and it's still ticking and still beating and I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. You know, let's go on and talk a little bit about your children. You yeah. have a son and a daughter. Your daughter's yeah. 10 and your son is five, oh, darling. And yeah. so let's go on and tell us a little bit about, tell us about your daughter first. Well, my daughter's name is Zoe, and uh, she's, like you said, 10 years old, and she's just, you know, she's full of life. Her, her name means life. Um, she's she's into musical theater. Uh, she's into, she's taking voice lessons right now. Uh, she's taking piano lessons, and she's an amazing dancer. Uh, she's taking dance lessons. So she's just, she's an all-around performer, and, um, you know, she's just, she's on her way. And does she understand that she's part of this major legacy? Absolutely, she does. I mean, we talk about the Dominican. As a matter of fact, on Father's Day yesterday, she was. We were talking. She was like, you know, you know, I really, I'm really confused about the Dominican Republic because I read that there was like some racism there, and and so we literally had a talk about the Dominican Republic yesterday about some of the the racial issues that they're experiencing. So she's she's fully aware. When I learned about my my ancestry and my heritage i mean she was one of the first people that i went to and, and told because i mean it's it's mind-boggling to me you know so i wanted to share with her uh my son knows a little bit about it about the heritage he knows that his grandfather played but you know he's five so it's it's not you know there's only so much he can retain at this point Fabulous. Let's go to a picture of your son. This is actually the picture, and I should say a little bit of the background. Uh, Thaddeus is married to a former student of mine, Heather, and I follow her on Instagram, and she posted this picture. It's been at least a year, and I messaged her. I said, you've got to tell me about this picture. I absolutely love it. So, Thaddeus, tell us about this picture. Well, first of all, I'm a diehard Saints fan, as you can see uh, by my hat. So I just had to mention that. But, you know, I don't even remember what we were looking at. It was probably, you know, I, I'm jogging my memory, but I think it was a video of Miles Davis or, or some somebody in that era. So we'll say, you know, 50s, 60s, Miles Davis. And, you know, honestly, this picture is great for several reasons. One of the reasons is because he and I typically don't have those kind of moments. You know, we don't – it's not like, you know – I talked to Wynton about this, and you can watch interviews with Wynton Marcellus, and he'll tell you just because he grew up in a musical family, it wasn't like they were all sitting around after dinner playing the blues at the piano. It was, it was a normal family, right? So this picture is, is really cool because it's one of the rare moments where, you know, he was calm enough to just sit there. And I probably was sitting there first checking something out, and then he came, and he got lost in it, and we got lost in that moment. Love it. That is yeah. that is really special. Okay, here's another picture, and you were telling me that one of the things that you did to help your children and inspire and support them is you took them to music stores. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my daughter, when she was younger, she gravitated towards the guitar, the acoustic guitar, actually, uh, instinctively, and, and she kind of dabbles with it now, but her main thing is voice and dance and theater. But my son, you know, he did the same thing. And I think it's just a kid thing to, to gravitate towards the, the most showy kind of thing. So he's gravitating towards drums and guitar right now. And it doesn't seem to be a phase. It doesn't seem to be, okay, I'm just going to, you know, every single time we go in the music store, he's going to the drums first and foremost. And then when we're leaving, he sees the guitar. It's like, oh, yeah, that's right. I like guitar, too. So he'll go and grab a guitar and we'll just sit there and, you know, I'll show them how to hold it. I'm not a guitarist, so I don't, you know, proclaim to know anything about it other than I love them. And uh, I'm a closet drummer. So if I didn't play anything else, I would have been a drummer. So the fact that he's really into drums is is a great thing for me. And he's, you can change it. And he's a, uh, one of the first ones in your family to like the drums, correct? Yeah. Well, I don't know if he's the first to like them because I definitely love them. But if he sticks with drums, he would definitely be one of the first, if not the first, in my family to, to be a drummer. Fabulous. And here he is playing a little miniature trumpet. At yeah. Least. Yeah, it's called a pocket trumpet. And, right. uh, you know, they're actually, I mean, they're professionals who play that instrument, but it's just 
obviously it's like tailor made for little hands and, and little kids. Um, but that warmed my heart the most because, I mean, if he wants to play trumpet, obviously I would support that 100 percent. But um, I never thought that he would gravitate towards it like that. And he, he grabbed it and he looks like a natural, you know, holding yeah. it like that. Yeah. <laughs> Darling, yeah. we he's have got that look in his eye. Yeah, <laughs> we've got a couple of questions. Let's um, right. this one right here. There's right. one question. I'd like to get more info into jazz, but there seems to be many options. Where should I start? Who's your favorite? What's the greatest jazz al al album of all time? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of debate right now in jazz in general because of that fact. Because when you say jazz to one person. One person is going to say Louis Armstrong, but another person is going to say Kenny G, right? So there's this wide spectrum of what jazz means to people. And, and the short answer of it is that it's all of that. That's the beautiful thing about jazz is that jazz from its inception all the way until now is it's like a sponge. But, you know, that's the, the first analogy that comes to my mind, but it, it has the ability to absorb whatever's around it, be it, you know, classical music, be it from classical music all the way up into hip hop today. Jazz has the ability to absorb whatever's around it, whatever's current, whatever's past, and, and pro project into the future, right? So your entry point to jazz can be anywhere. I can say, well, go check out some Louis Armstrong, and that'll be jazz. But I could also say, check out my music right now or my contemporaries and that's also jazz but i guess the most popular uh commercially and uh critically acclaimed jazz album of all time is a record by miles davis called kind of blue and and kind of blue has stood the test of time because it's it's artistically it was groundbreaking at the time I won't go into the, the nuts and bolts of it, but it was groundbreaking in, I, I think it was 1958 uh, with some of the stuff that they were doing musically. But outside of that, it just it just sounds and feels good. So it, it, it won't tax you mentally. It won't tax you, you know, on any level. It just feels good. And that's why it stands the test of time. And I think currently it's still the most, uh, highest grossing jazz album of all time still to this day. Miles okay. Davis, kind of blue. That's incredible. There's another question. Um, someone's going to New Orleans. So mm. they said, I'm planning to go to New Orleans. What's, where's the best place to see jazz and what kind? Okay. So I recommend three places. All right. The first place is Preservation Hall, right? And I forget the year that that place started, but Preservation Hall basically keeps the tradition, the, the real tradition of New Orleans, and we'll say just New Orleans music, but New Orleans jazz, it, it keeps the tradition alive. They tour all over the world. There's a band called the Preservation Hall Jazz Band, but their home in New Orleans is called Preservation Hall. So I would, I would recommend that just because it, they sound great and because of the historical factor. All right, so you start there. And then there's another place in New Orleans called Snug Harbor Jazz Bistro. And, and uh, Ellis Marcellus, the patriarch of the Marcellus family, he plays a regular gig there on every Friday. I believe he's still playing that. He was doing it for 20 plus years. So I'm not certain if he's still doing it, but I recommend that just to get the, the, the contemporary aspect of what New Orleans jazz is. But in between those two things, if you go down the Frenchman Street in New Orleans, there's going to be a brass band playing on the street. And that brass band playing on the street is the bridge between Preservation Hall and Snug Harbor. And you can go see that for free. So to, to really get the real experience of New Orleans, you have to experience it like a, a local would, right? So find, find a brass band somewhere playing somewhere, either on the street or you know, check out WWOZ. That's the local radio station. And uh, any information that you need, who's playing where, they'll let you know. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to go to the next one. Uh, go to the next one from there. Okay, tell us about this one. This is your son seeing your picture on the marquee, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the coolest venues in Dallas is the Kessler. It's a historic venue that they actually just recently renovated. It's a theater. Uh, I guess they renovated it maybe 10 years ago. But anyway, it's one of my favorite places to play in Dallas. And uh, I was playing there this past April, I think it was. And so we were in this restaurant in Dallas, and I saw the poster up. And so I, I had my son find his name on the marquee. So his name is my name. Excuse me. I'm Thaddeus the second. He's Thaddeus the third. So he found his name on the marquee, and we pointed to it, and Heather snapped his picture. And, it, you know, it was just a proud moment. That is darling. Okay, going to next. Yeah. Okay, and you were at a museum here, correct? Yeah, that's the Fort Worth uh, Museum of Art, and uh, that exhibit is KAWS, K-A-W-S, uh, the gateways from, I want to say, Japan, but that exhibit was touring across the country, and uh, that picture doesn't even, you know, let you know or tell you, like, how awe-inspiring that was. I mean, that statue was huge, and uh, so we were just kind of checking it out. Um, I, I think, you know, even though I'm a musician, I think, you know, visual art and photography and dance and, you know, culinary arts, all those things speak to what I do as a musician. And I try to, you know, expose my children, even if they choose to be actual musicians, I just want them to check out art in general to inform whatever they do artistically. It will certainly enrich and make their life better. I totally agree with Absolutely. you. Now we're going to get into a little bit about your band. Um, tell us a little sure. bit about it, about the pieces that you've uh, composed and, and so forth. Go ahead. That picture right there is actually the Kessler Theater, and that was the show that my son was pointing to on the, uh, the poster there. So uh, I've got a five-piece band, and that fluctuates depending on the show. It can go anywhere between three and six pieces. I've got a vibraphone player, as you can see in that picture. I've got a drummer electric guitar, bass, and my bass player uh, does some electronic things. So so my jazz, quote unquote, is very contemporary. You know, I'm, I'm deeply rooted in the past and the traditions that I learned from my family and growing up in New Orleans, but I also have a very, um, for lack of a better term, contemporary vein to what I do. It's, I like to think that it's, it's now, the past, and the future. And, uh, you know, I know that that can sound pretty esoteric sometimes and, you know, whatever the case may be. But I really believe that because being from New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz, being a sixth generation jazz musician, I mean, it's in my DNA. I could try to run from it, but it, it's going to come out of my pores. And so I embrace that. And everywhere I go around the world, you know, people love and appreciate the fact that what I'm doing now, it's not just I didn't pull it out of the sky. You know what I mean? It's it's rooted and and it has a foundation for me uh, as my family, but also just musically, it's, it's deeply rooted. Um, so yeah. Okay, and and also you were saying that after your heart attack, your music changed somewhat. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Why did it change? And you go ahead. Sure. When it, when I was in high school and I decided I wanted to be a professional musician. There was always something in me that said I never wanted to be a working musician. I wanted to be a working artist. But being in a place like New Orleans and having such a tradition in the city, but also having the the pressure and of, of coming from a musical family, you know, I wanted to learn the tradition and I wanted to be in the tradition. But I always knew that there was something in me that wanted to break free from the tradition. Uh, always pay respect, always pay homage, but to put my unique personal stamp on it right now. And so prior to my heart attack, I, I mean, I traveled the world playing traditional jazz music, you know, be it from the style of Louis Armstrong all the way through the brass band tradition, the second line tradition in New Orleans. And, and I, I did really well. You know, I started traveling the world when I was 19 years old. My first trip was to Istanbul. We played a major jazz festival in Istanbul. I was with a group called Kubone and uh, 19 years old. So, you know, I was able, you know, it, it's, it's strange because in New Orleans, you can do that. Like, that's not unique to me. You know, there are people who are traveling the world when they're 13, you know, so it's not unique to me. So you can sort of 
I don't want to say get caught in that trap because it's not a trap. It's a beautiful thing. But for me, I always knew that I had something else in me. But I did that all the way from 19 till, you know, my early 30s. But after the heart attack, I decided that when I can play again, because I couldn't play for nine, ten months, I believe, and I couldn't play again, I couldn't play. So I told myself if and when I could start playing again, that I would play music that was unique to me. And so, it, that, I mean, that was a scary transition because not only was I coming off of the fact that I physically had a heart attack and the trumpet is one of the most physical instruments you could ever play. So there was that aspect, you know, it was mental. It's like, wow, I'm, you know, I haven't played in nine months. Literally, I have didn't touch the trumpet for nine plus months. So it was that aspect. But it was also the emotional and mental aspect of like, okay, everybody knows me for this. Everybody knows me for make me a pallet on the floor and, and this and things in that vein. So will they accept me if I start playing tunes like Malta is not Rome or Afranola, you know, my personal tunes. And so it was really scary. But, you know, when, when you lay on the, the operating table or the ER table and the doctor says you're having a heart attack, you know, it's, it's like a transition, you know, whatever you thought, Whatever you feared, whatever you wanted, whatever you didn't want, all of that is is comes to question. It, it comes to the top, like the cream. So it's like, okay, well, did I really want that? Did I really? Who am I? And those those you you're now in a place to where you can really start answering those questions. When you and it's like you and I talked about before. It's like you know why do you have to have some type of traumatic personal experience for you to start realizing that okay you know we're not promised tomorrow so if you're going to do something get to it amazing incredible so your family obviously they've accepted this new um, music because it combines elements of jazz and all of these things that are near and near to your heart and, it, and i'm sure well, more or less well. yeah more or less i mean you know my family is is very traditional and so um, I would say they accept it, but it, it's not it's not like, you know, there, there's some like, well, maybe you should be doing this or maybe you should be should be doing that. And that's all a part of it. You know, to, to truly be an artist, I think you have to take risks. And it, it's a it's a double whammy for me because I come from a musical family that has six, gen five generations before me of a certain thing. And so you always want to pay homage to that and respect it. But, you know, when you start stepping out into something else, you know, there can be some some other things, you know. But somebody told me something recently, and I can't, I want to, you know, the strangest thing, social media is great because so many people that I've never met in my life who knew my grandfather or who knew my dad played in the military or played in bands, they all find me some kind of way and they reach out to me and they, you know, they tell me stuff like, man, your dad will be extremely proud of what you're doing. And when they tell me my grandfather will be proud, I mean, that hits home like no other because my grandfather was in, in my heart right now still my greatest fan. So, you know, the, the stuff that I'm doing right now, I have to believe in my heart that, you know, even if nobody else loves it, the fact that I'm pushing the envelope of, what my family is in this lexicon of jazz music means so much to me. Love it. And you had mentioned to me that even though your uh, grandfather Clarence has passed uh, away, that you felt that he was very happy with what you were doing yeah. and the change that yeah. you were doing. So that's great. We have another question uh, that's yeah. coming. It's, um, no, not that one, this one. <laughs> It says, are there hard lines of what is and isn't considered jazz? Absolutely. You know, and again, we spoke about it a little while ago. I mean, that is the current state of jazz is that it's really, it's, it's, in a, it's always transitioning because it's, it's, it's past and present and future all at the same time, even at its inception. So I don't want to say that it's in transition right now because it's always in transition. It's a living music. So we create the music on the bandstand. That's the, that in and of itself is the defining thing of what jazz is, is that we have a framework 
but the musicians create the music in that moment, right? So a classical piece of music is going to be played the same way every single time. When Beethoven wrote his Fifth Symphony, people are still playing it like that right now. But a song like Make Me a Pallet on the Floor, you know, I don't know when it was written. I know Louis Armstrong recorded it, but I'm not trying to play it like Louis Armstrong right now. You know, I'm going to I'm going to touch on Louis Armstrong because that's how we pay homage to our ancestors and to what came before us. But the beauty of the music is that I have the opportunity right now to say, here's Thaddeus for the second in 2018. This is what I think about. Make me a pallet on the floor. And, and that's the beauty of, of what jazz is. And, and outside of all the technical aspects of it, outside of the commercial stamps placed on it, if you don't remember anything else, jazz has the ability to absorb anything around it and make it right now. That's what makes it so popular, too. Yeah. Now, this is the cover of um, the the song that you composed, Afranola. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I originally wrote a bass line about 15 years ago when I was still in New Orleans, and I didn't have a melody. I didn't have a melody to it. It was just this bass line um, that just this reoccurring bass line. They call it an ostinato, where it's just like a, a repeating bass line, and, and you have that a lot in, in uh, indigenous musics, uh, Indian and African and West Indian. It's just you know a repeated bass line. So I, I had this bass line in my head for like 15 plus years, and about three or four years ago, I finally heard a melody on top of it. I mean, it, it, I wasn't even trying to. It was just, it finally came to me. And so we took that melody and took that bass line and filled in the gaps in the middle of it. And uh, that's what came out. So the reason that I called it Afranola is because I wanted to pay homage to my African, Dominican, and New Orleans heritage. But I recorded it in Dallas, which is where I've been and who I've been for the last 14 years. I've been living in Dallas for 14 years now. So that song encapsulates everything that I am musically. It sounds like yesterday. It sounds like today. It sounds like the future. It sounds like Africa, New Orleans, Dallas. It, it, I mean, and honestly, I planned it that way, but the way it came out, you, you could, I couldn't have planned it that way. It literally is a snapshot of, of everywhere I've been, where I am, and where I'm going. And, and you, it's available on iTunes, and I know it's available on Amazon, and yeah, it's wonderful, as well as others, and there's links in the blog that will take you right to it, or you can even go on to any of those and just write in Thaddeus Ford, and it will also come up as well. This has been amazing. We have one last picture. Oh, that's that's of your band too, right? That's my band, yep. Okay, yeah, perfect. Great, great group of guys, great group of guys. And then here is your darling family. So yeah. and I think it's just amazing that you're passing this incredible legacy on to the seventh generation, and they will grow up knowing that they're part of a very important legacy, and there's not too many families that can boast that. Yeah. So yeah. congratulations. And Thank is there you. any last words that you would like to say that, you know, that we can remember in terms of, you know, the our family, our children, how we pass things down to them, um, anything that you would like to say about your music? Well, I just, you know, one of the models that I, I live by right now is character before content. And I think that we live in a, a day and age where, you know, content is like available like air. And I, I don't see it slowing down anytime in the future. So more than artists, more than creators, I think we need artists and creators who are trying to develop their character as well as their content. And I think, you know, if I don't do anything else with my children or the kids that I teach, because I'm, I'm actually doing a program right now where we're teaching um, New Orleans second line music and dance culture to a bunch of kids. We've got about 40 kids right now we're, we're teaching. And if I don't do anything else, I want to embody the kind of person that promotes character before content. Because if you develop your character, while you're developing your content, your content will be that much more potent and stand the test of time and, and, and dare I say, help to heal people, places, and, and circumstances. So character before content. 
Love that. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your all of your um, all of the different comments that you've made and everything. I really enjoyed it. Hopefully, our audience has enjoyed it. Thank you, those of you who have made comments. Those of you who have come to support this. We really appreciate it. You can also go on my blog. Um, and this this past week, in honor of Father's Day, I was looking for an amazing father, and Thaddeus definitely fit the bill on that. So the entire blog is about Thaddeus and his legacy and what he does to support and encourage his children, about his band, some of the, you know, about his heart attack. And there's links to his Facebook page. There's links to his music and uh, all different other things. There's also a video there you can watch. And this past week on the 6 o'clock block on Facebook Live, or on Facebook rather, on Good Parenting Brighter Children, I've uh, posted different things about his life that are available. So take advantage and look at those. And thank you again for coming. And thank you, Thaddeus. This is fabulous. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right. Good night. <laughs>